I've paid thousands of dollars in courses to learn what you're basically teaching on your podcast for free what you're putting out there is so valuable. So, you know, I just really want to acknowledge you and I definitely send everyone to your podcast. You were virtually one of the first mentors that I looked up to and started following. You're always one step ahead of the game. So I just wanted to give you kudos and props for that because lots of people are watching, lots of people are learning from it. Tucker and the whole TTM crew, Dan and Chris, thanks so much for your support. I love what you guys do and a huge, huge fan. Having this support's huge. So I'm grateful for that. What's up, everybody out there in listener land? This is episode 334 of the Real Deals Podcast. And as always, I am your host, Tucker Merrihue. I want to thank you for joining me for another episode. Hey, I've got one this week. It's going to be you, me, and the microphone. It's a topic that I've actually never talked about. Believe it or not, 334 episodes, and I've never talked about this, which I probably should have talked about it a long time ago, to be honest with you because it's a huge part of real estate investing overall. I know it doesn't make it into the conversation these days with kind of the quick money side of real estate, the active income component of real estate investing, whether it be flipping, wholesaling, wholetailing, um, you know, rehabbing, building, uh, you know, a lot of the times that's an active money component or an active income component. So this week, I wanna talk about the part of real estate investing that's uh, the tax minimization slash tax avoidance part of real estate investing. And the reason why I'm gonna talk about this, and just if you guys haven't figured it out already, it's called the 1031 exchange. And the reason why I'm gonna talk about this um, this week is because I'm in the middle of doing one myself. And uh, I figure it's very relevant, it's timely, I got my closing statements, I got all the costs itemized. I've uh, you know taken a real deep look at this business uh, or the business that surrounds a 1031 exchange. And I got a lot of ideas and I got a lot of um, feedback and input that I want to give you guys. Um, and maybe you'll walk away f- uh, from the show with, uh, you know, a-, a gazillion dollar idea. I'll plant in your head at the end of it. So stick around for that. And uh, I know you guys are going to dig it. Now, before we get into this week's show, God, we've had a lot going on. It's been a busy, busy week since uh, the last time uh, I talked to you guys. I took a week off last week. We just had a lot going on. Um, to be totally honest with you, and sometimes it's just it's hard to get a show out with uh, running a real business here and doing all the projects that we have and, and the different business adventures that we have um, and different irons in the fire. But last week was a really cool week for us um, kind of off the show. Um, we had uh, a couple fine gentlemen come into town, um, Elliot and Cole, who are my partners in the uh, Call Magic uh, Cole Calling Company. They came into Portland here and uh, we hung out, watched the Blazer game on Thursday night. Watched them advance to the playoffs, so they play the Lakers tonight. Uh, that's when I'm recording this. Hopefully they win when you guys hear this. Hopefully they've won uh, game one. But uh, And then they came into the office on Friday, and uh, we really mapped out a lot of really cool stuff that we're going to be doing um, with uh, Call Magic and the different marketing channels that we're gonna fulfill for investors. And so right now, um, you know, a lot of you guys have reached out to us and we've got you set up. We're doing some calling for you uh, via our Call Magic cold call company. But we've got a lot of really other amazing things on the horizon that we're going to kind of package with the cold calling that we're going to do for people. So one of those is uh, we're going to be doing texting for you as well. We're going to manage the leads and then we're going to just kind of kick through the ones that um, are worth following up with and kind of actually having a conversation with. And so we're going to be doing that in conjunction with the cold calling and we're also going to be able to send out your uh, RVMs for you as well or give you a platform where you can execute those in addition to getting your text leads and your cold call leads. So we're building out this super cool thing. Fortunately, Cole is much smarter than me when it comes to technology. And so he can take my crazy ideas and he can make them a reality for you guys. So anyway, that's what's coming down the pipe. We're probably, I don't know, maybe a month or two away from having that platform set up so that we can kind of fulfill other marketing channels for you guys as well. But in the meantime, if you guys want uh, to get some cold call going or cold calling going uh, for your business to really supercharge the amount of leads that you have coming into it, uh, make sure to uh, reach out to us uh, and go to callmagicleads.com and uh, book a call. Elliot will hop on with you and he'll explain everything that you need to know about data, number of callers, cost, um, who you should be calling, just everything, right? So make sure you go there and check it out. Uh, We'd love to uh, start calling for you and, and generate a lot more leads for your business. So Uh, That's what's coming. That's what's going on there. Uh, This week, as I said, I'm dealing with my own 1031 exchange, um, which has got me thinking a lot. And that's why I'm going to do this show. But bigger than that, uh, uh, something that's been kind of building for the last five years, actually. And uh, for many of you guys that are friends with me on Facebook, you probably saw the video that I posted yesterday where I was standing on site with our 
actual building permit. Uh, it's taken five years, but we finally got the building permit issued uh, on our view out project that looks over Lake Oswego. You know, a lot of people were posting in the comments like, why in the world would it take that long? And you know, to be totally honest with you, I don't have a great answer other than the fact that it involved neighbors, it involved a ridiculous lawsuit, it involved uh, the city, and it involved uh, the geotech game, which now I am very privy to on how those geotechs operate and how they like to deflect any risk at all. And uh, I just had to learn all that stuff and deal with all of the BS in the middle. And, you know, it ended up taking five years. But we're here now, and the positive part is is that uh, after I record this with you guys um, this afternoon, I've actually got a call with uh, a buyer for the lot in the house. So it may be sold already, which uh, is the silver lining, I guess, in this whole thing. But anyway, big week for us uh, on many fronts, uh, that being one of them. So... That's uh, pretty much the, the stuff that I want to mention about me. Um, other than that, I do have some housekeeping items, though. Some things that I want to mention uh, real quick are negotiating with Sellers 2.0. Many of you guys that are on our email list, we released the new version of this training. I know it's been around for about four or five years, eh, maybe five years now. And so the information within it is still as valuable as it was the day that we released it in terms of how to negotiate with sellers, how to get prices out of people, how to structure your conversations, um, how to structure your negotiations. Uh, but we added to it and we filled in uh, the different lead types that are now available in our space, right? When we first started that training, there were no ringless voicemails. There was virtually nobody doing cold calling. But now that there is, we need to make sure that we have training for you guys to really understand how to maximize those leads, how to do those callbacks, how to connect with those sellers, how to bridge the gap, how to get them to know who you are and why you're calling them, right? So we released our Negotiating with Sellers 2.0. Uh, if you guys have not already, I strongly encourage you to go check it out. We'll also have a link to that in the um, website or in the uh, show notes page here and in the email that goes out with the show. Um, but uh, we put it on Teachable this time, which is, a, a, I think, just a better platform. It's a better way to consume it. Um, it organizes it nicely, and um, it's just it's a great platform for learning. And so we put the, uh, the training on Teachable this time so you guys can get access to it there. But I highly encourage you to do it. We really put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making this um, the most updated and awesome sales training, uh, specifically for buying houses. Not just general sales training, but specifically for buying houses. Because that's what we do. That's what we've done for you know ten plus years, direct to seller. So we've basically mastered the art of these conversations, and then we kind of lay that all out for you guys. So make sure you go check it out. Um, other than that, uh, D for D app users. Hey, if you're using the app. Um, we've got uh, new skip trace pricing. Uh, it's much lower and uh, we can get that knocked out for you. So make sure you reach out to us about that. Um, if you're an app user and you're using um, the just list building feature where you can build as big a list as you want with just property addresses, you can then take those property addresses and, and ultimately we can skip trace them for you for uh, cheaper than anybody in the market right now because we've got a new data contract. So we wanna be able to pass that savings on to you. So keep an eye out for those emails and reach out to Dan uh, if you want some skip tracing done because we can basically beat anybody's pricing at this point. Um, last but not least, our DFA. We got a lot of great people in there, folks. Um, you know, the guys that came here last week, both in DFA, um, there's just, God, there's like 122 odd people right now, I think, in the DFA. All fantastic people. So if you're interested in kind of a group mastermind setting, you want to have more access to myself, um, you know, I hop on and talk to people whenever they need it. I'm in there every single day. So is Chris, so is Dan, so is everybody else. Um, we'd love to have you. And it's been around for going on uh, since 2004. 14, I think. So six plus years going on seven years. So we must be doing something right, guys. So reach out to us. We'd love to make you a part of that community. We'd love to get to know you and your business a little better. And the best part is it's only $1.99 a month. So for a mastermind group, it's as cheap as you're going to find. And we give as much value as you're going to find. So anyway, we'd love to hear from you. So that's pretty much what's going on with me. Those are the housekeeping items. So without further ado, let's get into the show and let's learn all about 1031 exchanges and the opportunities surrounding them. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and 
want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, Do yourself a favor, reach out to Ironbridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. All right, everybody, it's main topic time. And this week's main topic, as you heard in the intro and you probably saw for the uh, tagline for this episode, we're going to talk all about a 1031 exchange. And, you know, ultimately, this is a, a tool that a lot of investors get to eventually. It's kind of as you start to climb the real estate ladder. If you've owned real estate for a while, then you'll probably cross the bridge of needing to do a 1031 exchange or should uh, be doing a 1031 exchange in order to avoid uh, a massive amount of tax liability because ultimately that's what it does. It just allows you to defer paying taxes and the old saying is defer, 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 and then die, right? It's kind of a morbid saying, but ultimately you're trying to defer paying any of the depreciation that you've taken against the real estate that you own. And then once you die, uh, you know, it's there's the step up uh, cost basis or whatever they call it, where basically all that depreciation that you took over the course of your lifespan goes away. And then you can pass that real estate on uh, at a stepped up value to your next of kin. And they don't have to pay all of that uh, depreciation that you've accumulated over the years. So for example, um, the house that I am selling uh, this past week, or I have sold now by the time I recorded this, uh, I've owned it since 2006 is when I bought it. Not the best time to buy it. It was kind of at the top of that market cycle, but it was in a good part of uh, town here. It was actually about two minutes from the office, and so it was one that uh, I just held through, uh, we'll call it the the shit, right? Uh, 2008, 9, 10, 11. Um, and so I just held it and I rented it. Rents were pretty low. It was pretty heavily leveraged at the time, um, you know, compared to what I bought it for. So it, it wasn't like a cash cow by any means. It just kind of broke even. And I kind of, you know, kept this thing around for a long time. And ultimately, I ended up selling it uh, this past week. And so the way it broke down is since I owned it since 2006, I got a somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a year of depreciation um, on my tax return or against my income, right? So that house basically pushed down my taxable income somewhere between fifteen and twenty grand a year. Um, now that's a good thing, obviously, because I'm not paying taxes, and if you're in the highest tax bracket, um, you know every twenty grand that uh, you get pushed down is you know somewhere between eight and ten grand that you save, right? Ultimately. And so that's a good thing. And that's why, you know, ultimately you want to have a lot of rentals and then you want to try and upsize those rentals so that you get more depreciation in one building, let's say, versus having to spread them across multiple. Um, That's why people kind of grow from houses to, you know, commercial or apartment buildings or, you know, uh, all kinds of things like that, right? Bigger structures that have more depreciation and then you can ultimately take uh, accelerated depreciation and and all that stuff. So that's a whole nother topic. But what I want to break down for you guys is, is my personal example, right? So I was taking depreciation on this particular rental since 2006. And so if I had sold this property outright, I did the math, um, and I just took the profit that I had in the deal, right? Basically what I took, well, it doesn't even matter what I took for profit, but let's just say I sold the house, right? Whatever I sold it for, it doesn't matter. But the first approximately $90,000, uh, it might even been closer to a hundred, but the, let's just say for argument's sake, the first $90,000 goes to the government because it's called recapture on the depreciation that I've taken since 2006. So they have to recapture all of those taxes that I didn't have to pay uh, because I had that approximately fifteen dollars to $20,000 worth of income push down every year. Uh, but if I sold this outright, they would then recapture on all that depreciation and the tax benefit that I got from taking it. So that leaves me in a position where it's like, well, 
Am I going to hand the government 90 plus thousand dollars just because I'm selling this asset? Or should I roll it and buy something else, right? Well, I'm going to roll it, of course, and buy something else because I'm not going to just hand them 90 grand when I don't have to when there's another option. And that's why most people end up doing a 1031 exchange. Well, not likely. It's why they do a 1031 exchange, right? So for me, um, you know, I sold this property and then now I'm on the hunt and I'm looking for something new. And I'll get into what I'm looking for and, and how that factors into what we've built here in terms of a marketing machine and why you need all that. But let's first uh, kind of identify who's involved, right? Who's involved when you do a 1031 exchange? Well, you go through the transaction like you would any normal transaction, right? You've got yourself, you've got the buyer. If you're the seller, you have a buyer. Uh, you have your title company. Maybe you have realtors involved. If you're listing it on the open market, you're paying commissions. It's a typical transaction, just like anything else, right? But right at the end, right before closing, uh, you have to have a 1031 exchange facilitation company that basically handles all the paperwork uh, with the 1031 exchange. And ultimately, they hold your money as well, right? So they essentially have an escrow account that holds all of your proceeds until you find a new property uh, to deploy that money into. And so for me, I went and signed, uh, what was it, Friday, it closed Friday. And so there was, you know, approximately six figures worth of um, money that then had to float to the 1031 exchange company. I could not touch it. It's very similar to like when we take on private lenders. Uh, we never touch the money. It just goes to the title company. Title company secures it as a first position deed of trust um, as part of the purchase. Same idea in terms of we never get to touch the money, right? So the gal, the closing gal was like, hey, your wire will be out, you know, end of the day. And I had to email her back and say, I don't get any of this money. It goes to 1031 Exchange Company, but thanks. And she was like, oh, okay. Well, I'm not sorry. The wire doesn't go out then, right? It was a little joke. But point is, is that that money, all that money from the sale goes to the 1031 Exchange Company and they hold it in an escrow account and wait for me to purchase something new. Now, one of the questions that people often have, and, and I did too because this was uh, the first time that I've done one myself, is what what's the cost, right? Uh, beyond what the process, and, and the process was super simple, by the way. We just basically gave them the contract, the title report um, for the property that I was selling, and then they generated the 1031 exchange documents. They sent those to closing. I signed those, uh, but within those, it had the pricing of approximately what a 1031 exchange costs on the facilitation side for these companies. And the total cost for selling and then rebuying is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 bucks. So really pretty minimal. Um, I thought it was going to be a lot more, to be totally honest with you, uh, but it wasn't. It's only about 1000 to 1500 bucks to sell a house and buy a house. Now, if you're buying a more complex asset on the other side, I think they raised the prices slightly, but for argument's sake, let's just go apples to apples and house to house here in terms of what we're selling, what we're buying. So somewhere between 1000 and 1500 bucks, which is totally reasonable. And obviously these 1031 exchange companies are just operating purely on volume and that's how they're making their money, but it's a pretty simple deal for them. They just, you know, hold money and send money. That's really all they're doing. And then they make 1000 to 1500 bucks in the interim and, and do some, you know, boilerplate paperwork and kind of report to the IRS and where's needed or where is needed. But uh, they basically hold your money and then they redeploy it. So you then have to go find something to buy, right? That's the next um, challenge. That's the part that I always thought, wow, that there's an opportunity there. There's something there or there's a big challenge there, right? Anywhere there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. And so the average person doing a 1031 exchange right now, because I'm, I'm trying to look at this, you know, from our perspective, we have this marketing machine. We have all these opportunities we're looking at for flip, build, redevelopment. Rarely do we look at them from rental perspective here because the numbers just don't generally make sense if you're coming out of pocket for the whole thing that you're going to buy. Now, if you're rolling money from a previous sale, it's basically money you've accumulated that you can't do anything else with. It changes the dynamic of the rental game here because you've got this basically this big chip that you can you know use and apply towards any purchase and you're not coming out of pocket. You have to apply that chip towards a new purchase. So most people... You know, right now we have inventory 1.2 months, right? So a lot of people are selling things and then they have to go buy something, right? And so it's tough. It's really, really tough for them to find inventory to buy. And that's, that's the biggest challenge. I mean, it's a huge challenge for them because ultimately what they end up doing is they end up just buying inventory that's okay, and that's it. And there isn't any real built-in margin. Um, a lot of times they're up against the clock and they're just trying to, um, you know, satisfy, you know, the, the time constraints on a 1031 exchange. And that's it. So just like, you know, if somebody's looking for a house to buy, right, and they're, and they're looking to move in, they're moving somewhere, they have to buy a house, right? Well, sometimes they just settle and they buy whatever's available at whatever price, you know, within their approximate ballpark price range that they can. Same thing applies to a 1031 exchange, except for there's a, a hard uh, 
exit <laughs> that you have to redeploy that money. And so I have to identify uh, multiple properties that I'm going to deploy this money into within 45 days. And then I have to actually deploy and close the transaction within 180 days. So those are the, the time constraints. But as you butt up against those time constraints, if you're a just normal investor, somebody that's you know utilizing realtors and the MLS to buy product, it can get real challenging. And so that's, that's a huge opportunity. And so I'll get into that here in just a second. But you know, for us, we have a marketing machine. So like I mentioned, you know, we have marketing going out every day, we have leads coming in. And most of the time, we're looking at these leads from a, a quick buy sell perspective, right? How can we make money immediately buying it? Um, but when you have money to roll via 1031 exchange to reinvest, you can kind of look at stuff from a slightly different perspective, right? Um, I heard a quote once and I thought it was a really good quote. It was, uh, you know, deals uh, are kind of like uh, haircuts, right? I think that was how it went. Anyway, um, you know, it, it just depends on uh, how long, uh, well, I forget it, how long it goes to how good of a deal it is, right? So basically, if you're looking at a deal from a perspective of, you know, immediately you need to make money from it, you look at it from a very different lens than you know, if I'm looking at this for like a year, right? A year turn, what can I do with this? Um, so, you know, now that we're looking at all these opportunities with a, through that lens, it's just, it opens up the world of what we can do with the lead flow that comes in. Because most of the lead flow, let's be honest, it's like 80 cents on the dollar type stuff, right? Maybe 80, 85 cents. Um, and so we need to buy stuff, uh, you know, at 60 to 70 cents on the dollar um, to be able to account for repairs and selling costs and all those things to immediately make money. But if we're buying something at 85 cents on the dollar, um, it's really simple for us to uh, be able to redeploy this money into it and have a margin already. And then here's the kicker, and this is the thing that we're looking at is, can we buy this stuff at, you know, with a margin on the front end and then look at it from a redevelopment perspective down the line. So then there's even more of a, a value bump as we kind of head into the future, right? We see where the path of progress is um, and we kind of take that into account. So you start to look at things a little bit differently. So that's the cool part. But here's the idea, right? Um, here's the idea that I think I had this a long time ago, but now that I'm in this, um, we're really starting to try and put rubber to road here and make this happen. But, you know, we're buddy buddying up with the 1031 exchange company that's doing this for us, but they have a ton of clients, a lot of people that are trying to redeploy money. And virtually all of those people are having a hard time placing money, right? Most of them are going to end up buying an investment property at hundred cents on the dollar of what the market will pay for it. Not the greatest redeployment of money, but they have to, otherwise they might owe hundred grand in taxes like I do or more, right? And so the business model, the thing that we're going to do here is basically try and provide inventory for those types of buyers, those very, very motivated buyers that have money that they need to deploy. And so that's kind of our next uh, adventure here with, you know, let's call it 85 cents on the dollar, maybe even 90 cents on the dollar uh, product that people will buy because they're looking at it through a different lens, right? They're, they're looking at it from the lens of they need to redeploy money and they just want to buy something that's a good value, right? doesn't have to be an amazing value, but a good value. So anyway, there's your gazillion dollar idea for the day. If you can figure out how to do that in your market, you probably have a, you know, look at yourself as an incubator for 1031 transactions, right? You generate the leads, you tee up the deals and then you hand them off to very motivated buyers, which is, you know, essentially what uh, a lot of these bigger wholesale operations do in terms of finding the most motivated buyers. But these are not flip buyers. They're more like uh, rental long term hold buyers, uh, but they've got free money that they got to roll. So think about that. Let that sink in. Hopefully one of you guys out there takes that idea and runs with it. So that's um, what we're going to be doing. Uh, one thing I did want to mention right now, though, is that there are some challenges on the back end with the 1031 exchange right now and with investors because you know, earlier this year, there was this thing called non QM money, and it was falling from the sky. It was super easy to get. Uh, if you had good credit, uh, and you had assets that you could basically roll as a down payment into a purchase, it was stated income, it was credit only asset verification, and boom, you were done. It was that simple. And you got pretty good rates, the rates were in the fours, um, which most people gladly traded to not have to go through all of the conventional bullshit that goes into getting a loan. Um, but right now that non QM money isn't as cheap. It's in the, you know, mid sixes for that same type of product. And they've got some governors on how much they can lend based on what the rent is um, on the uh, asset that you're buying. And so that's a challenge. But what I've heard as of last night, so this is, uh, you know, my, uh, my little birdie in my ear told me that uh, as of sometime in September, non QM 30 year fixed money is coming back and it's coming back at much more attractive rates. So I'm kind of, um, I'm in the boat where uh, I'm going to probably use some of this non QM money to buy whatever it is that we buy next. Um, just because 
I haven't done the 2019 taxes yet. They got to be done by uh, October 15th. Um, and I'm not sure how much I want to show the government <laughs> either that I made this year. So I got to figure all that out. But uh, I'm going to be probably using non-QM money, especially if it comes back down um, significantly in terms of rates. But that's the one challenge on the other end of this. But once that gets worked out, which I think it will towards the end of this year, I think the, um, you know, the market for investors buying up property again is going to be fluid. And uh, they'll be happy to buy stuff that's off market that just has a little bit of margin or, or an opportunity attached to it beyond, you know, having been on the market and everybody and their mother bids on it and they pay more than everybody else because nobody wants to be in that situation. So anyway, 1031 exchanges are great. I'll just summarize here. Um, you know, for me personally, I'm avoiding about 90 to to $100,000 worth of tax liability on one single family rental um, by rolling this. And for us, you know, we're looking at trying to buy something that I can rent and then ultimately we can either fix up afterwards and sell for a much larger margin um, or we can redevelop and uh, I can buy it out the property uh, by the development company from myself maybe. We'll see how legal that is. I might have to kind of do something in between, uh, but we're looking to try and buy something with future redevelopment opportunity attached to it as well if possible. And uh, that would be the ultimate win because then I could turn this thing over in a year and we could generate a much bigger margin on it than just sitting on it and principal pay down and gradual appreciation. And then you kind of roll these bigger chips quicker and quicker and quicker. And that's kind of the 1031 exchange game. If you have a marketing machine attached to your business and you can generate these types of opportunities. So anyway, that's this week's show. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. It's a new facet for us. I've known about it, obviously. I've seen a lot of people do it, but once you start doing it yourself, you kind of get into the weeds a little more and you kind of see the details for what they are. So anyway, that's this week's show. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. We got a lot of stuff going on. If we can help you guys in any way, whether it be with our mastermind, our cold calling, our negotiating, our driving for dollars app, whatever it is, uh, make sure you reach out to us. Go find that stuff. Use it, folks. We put our blood, sweat, and tears into making those the best that we can and uh, really trying to serve the investment community uh, the best that we can. And uh, now that we're 334 episodes in, hopefully you guys believe that. All right, folks, that wraps up this week's show. I'll see you all 